Ovolian, psychiatric interpretation of mirror, neurons, and Dr. Beatriz Calvo's own equally original contributions in the realm of psychology. I venture to say we are in for a real treat, a true master class on how Girardian theory applications is best performed. And now, without any more ado, let me just give you a very brief outline sketch of our panel members' merits. Our first speaker, Dr. Orgolian, is a neuropsychiatrist and a psychologist that has been studying for nearly 40 years to apply the René Girard's findings in the field of psychology and psychopathology. Working side by side with Girard himself, the experience of this close collaboration is by this own admittance something that had a profound effect on Dr. Orgolian's outlook. He has worked as a neuropsychiatrist at the American, in the American Hospital of Paris since 1974 and head of the Department of Psychiatry since 1981, a position he held until 2007. Some of, of his most celebrated works are Things Hidden Since the Foundation of the World, <laughs> The Genesis of Desire, Desire, Psychopolitik, and the last one, The Mimetic Brain. Please, Dr. Julian, you have 40 minutes, more, more or less. Thank you for coming, for being here. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, first of all, for receiving me. I'm very honored and pleased to be here. Uh, and thank you, the University of Francisco de Vitoria. And I'm particularly moved to, to be here today because I can see in this audience a lot of the old boys, as I would say, you know, people who have been uh, with, with René and, and, and myself for many, many years. And of course, we, we can also probably all of us feel the, the brain and the soul and the thought of René Girard, you know, flying over us and watching over us. As a, as a matter of fact, as you just emphasized, you know, uh, I have met René when I was in an early age. I was 32, 33, and we became friends, started talking, you know, and I told them that uh, his theories and ideas would probably change completely the field of psychology and psychiatry. And he said, no, 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 I'm, a, I'm an anthropologist, I'm a literary critic, I'm a, I'm interested in literature, but I have nothing to do with psychology. And so I said, you don't know how much you have to do with it. And so we started working together. And of course, today, I cannot help pursuing the dialogue with René Girard in my mind, although, alas, he cannot answer me any longer. The question I would like to ask him, if he were here today, is how come we had to wait nearly 5,000 years after Aristotle for mimesis to be recognized as the fundamental founding mechanism in the genesis of cultures and societies and in the functioning of psychology and psychopathology. Indeed, Aristotle emphasized the fact that the little human is the most mimetic of animals and that by mimesis he acquires all his abilities. Later, Spinoza also emphasized the contagious nature of emotions and desires. Gabriel Tard published extensive studies about imitation without seeing all its consequences, especially the production of rivalry and violence. During a symposium that I had organized in Besançon in 1995, René Girard commented uh, in a very humorous way a text by Montaigne recounting the adventures of some of the soldiers of Alexander the Great in India who came upon a horde of aggressive monkeys. The soldiers started pulling out their swords and spears, but their commander told them to put down their weapons, grab ropes and vines, and pretend to tie one another up. Seeing that, the monkeys aped what the soldiers were doing and started tying and binding one another up, which allowed the soldiers to escape. <laughs> so you see that mimetic theory can be extremely useful saving your lives. <laughs> especially if you meet monkeys. 
Mimesis was considered as copying and replicating and aping until René Girard revealed that Mimesis was the origin of violence and the sacred and of the fundamental psychological and psychopathological mechanisms. In a recently published article, I was surprised to see that uh, an author called Gary Lasky wrote, Girardian mimeticism is only a footnote to Hegel's phenomenology of the spirit. Without being a specialist in Hegel's philosophy, I had already discussed a long time ago, with the help of Alexandre Kojev's reading, the Hegelian desire as opposed to mimetic desire. Hegelian desire is the desire to be desired by the other, to be admired and recognized by the other as being superior to him. This is the basis of the master-slave dialectic, heralding the class warfare of Karl Marx. In other words, Hegelian desire, in my view, is a particular type of structure <laughs> of mimetic desire where the model is systematically taken for a rival. In sum, Hegelian desire is not copied on the other's desire. It is not suggested by the other's desire, but aims at being the object of the other's desire. It is a desire for recognition by the other, who seems superior by what he has or what he is. And the struggle is aimed at depriving him of his belongings and his very being. If I cannot possess or appropriate his belongings, I will be satisfied just by depriving him of them. This is what I have called negative mimetic desire. Depriving the, others, the other of his belongings is class struggle. Communism and the fanaticism of equality, which we have developed very strongly in France, in a more subtle version, but based on the same principle, it is the justification of the French 75% income tax, which enchants all those who do not pay it. And in France, for the past few months, it is the moralization of public life, which consists in depriving elected politicians of any advantages they, they might have. W one thing wanting to deprive the other of his very being is the definition of terrorism. The Islamic terrorism of al-Baghdadi as well as Robespierre's terrorism in France. By the way, let me tell you that all the people who talk about terror and terrorism should remember that the only country where we had a government officially called the terror is France. Another possibility is to want to deprive the other of the object of his desire or oppose very strongly the achievement of that desire. The former case, the former case, the first one, is exemplified by the judgment of Solomon, which shows the real mother animated by real love giving away the object of her desire to save the life of the child, whereas the woman that, has not, that was not the real mother wanted the child to be cut in half. The latter is exemplified by uh, little story told by a psychiatrist by the name of Shoki Azuri. He tells us about this. A Lebanese legend tells the story of two prisoners sentenced to death. The officer who is about to execute them asks the first one, what is your last wish before you die? The man answers, I want to hug my mother and say goodbye to her before my death. The officer then turns to the second one and asks him, what is his last wish before dying? And he answers, prevent the other guy from hugging his mother. <laughs> and he concludes, this second character had no other interest but the destruction and obstruction of the desire of the first condemned man. Now, we could multiply examples and citations because the deeds and the dead ends are innumerable and unique. The dead ends where we can engage are innumerable. But unique is the past that leads to hardcore reality of the psychological functioning unveiled by the work of René Girard. If that reality has been so long avoided, it is because fundamentally it poses the problem of alterity. To accept the fact that my desire is not mine, it is not spontaneous, doesn't stem out of my inner being, 
doesn't belong to me, that it is copied and suggested by another, is a very difficult and, of course, fundamentally contrary to the Hegelian desire for recognition. This is very difficult to accept for the culture in general and for each of us in particular. However, claiming the ownership and priority of my desire over the others and over all others poses a second problem that is very difficult to tackle. If I am the owner of a spontaneous desire stemming out of my inner self, I am therefore responsible for it, whatever the consequences of that responsibility. Let me give you a brief historical overview of those two problems. You know, the problem of alterity is the problem of priority of desire, ownership of desire on the one hand, but also if you would take that, you have to, to, to tackle the problem of responsibility. And the whole history of psychology is, is revolves around those two problems. In Genesis, it starts very early. In Genesis 1.26, according to Andrei Shuraki's translation, Elohim says, we will make Adam out of soil in our likeness. In other translations, Elohim creates Adam in his image. Adam, made out of soil, of course, is entirely molded of otherness. And I have suggested in the Puppet of Desire to read the words in our likeness as this inscription by God in man of the first dimension of what I called universal mimesis, i.e. the spatial dimension, which is imitation. God's desire to create is evidently not mimetic, but Adam's desire will, of course, from now on, be purely mimetic, and I even advance the hypothesis that the desire transmitted by God in creating Adam is the desire to create, which makes, it, which, which makes him to the image of God, in, the, in, in as much as he has the desire to create, which is what makes Adam resemble God in a way. Man is made to create, create the other, create himself incessantly, and create things around him. However, alone, Adam cannot do anything. And God is going to create another being with the derived otherness. In Genesis 2.18, Elohim says, it is not good for Adam to be on his own. I'm going to make, and I cite the French, une aide contre lui, which literally means in English, a helper against him. Now, this would have enchanted Sacha Guitry, who was, as you know, very <laughs> But thus, mimesis contains not only imitation, and, but already from the very beginning of mankind, it contains not only imitation, but also rivalry. In fact, right from the beginning, rivalry is consubstantial with mimetic desire, as the rest of the story will show. The snake, which is an allegory of mimetic desire, in my view, will inject Eve with the venom of mimetic rivalry, making her consider God as a rival and no longer just a model. A rival in the sense that he wants to deprive her and Adam from the divinity which he keeps to himself. From now on, any prohibition will be perceived as protecting the desirable. This, by the way, proves the mimetic origin of curiosity, a wonderful quality in a scientist and the defect in most people. In any case, curiosity is awakened only when something is hidden, forbidden, or mysterious. I have explained at length my reading of Adam and Eve's theory in Genesis of Desire. I shall here only retain one aspect. When God gets angry and accuses Adam of having disobeyed and eaten from the forbidden tree, Adam recognizes the otherness of his desire, but at the same time claims his innocence, in other words, his lack of responsibility. The woman, he says, you put beside me, gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate it. Genesis 3, 12. When asked in turn, Eve also recognized the mimetic drive of her desire, but claims innocence, refuses responsibility by accusing the snake. The woman says, the snake fooled me, and I ate. Genesis 3, 13. Thus, since the dawn of history, the problem of otherness, mimetic desire, and responsibility is posed. This problem will appear in many forms throughout the history of mankind. In his book, La Maladie de l'âme, The Disease of the Soul, 
Jackie Pigeot, which is a very thick book, poses the problem of dualism versus monism since antiquity. He tells us the expression disease of the soul comes from Plato, and he emphasizes the following. By monism or dualism, we don't mean anything but this, the feeling of each of us of being one or two. This integrated duality would stir up debates throughout the history of medicine, philosophy, and psychiatry. In the beginning of my medical studies, psychosomatic medicine was in fashion, and there were numerous publications about this subject. With, one, with my friend Jacques-Marie Coldefi, chief surgeon of the psychiatric hospitals of Paris, I published a book called, at the time, A Psychosomatic Approach to the Medical and Surgical Practice. It was very much in fashion. Jacques Pigeot tells us that Galen insisted on the somatic origin of madness and maintained the militant dualism. Other physicians were less adamant about this than Galen. For instance, a dualist could perfectly well admit that primary diseases of the soul could have consequences on the body and that primary diseases of the body could affect the soul. The latter sounds very modern and everybody knows today the kind of disorders and physical symptoms that anxiety and stress can entail. We also know that the very first symptoms, for instance, of a cancer of the pancreas can very well be a state of depression or anxiety. In one of his fragments, Democritus says, medicine heals the diseases of the body, wisdom frees the soul of its passions. This debate has continued up to now. During the whole history of medicine and philosophy, dualism would both mask and contain otherness. As a matter of fact, body and soul are two entities which are not of the same nature. And therefore, it is difficult to conceive how they could interfere with each other. The soul, in particular, is a mysterious entity, that, the definition of which has given rise to infinite philosophical debates. From the start, however, the solution to the aporia seemed to lie in otherness. Jacques Pigeot says, Galen thinks Apollo is right when he demands in Delphi, in, on, on his temple, that we should know ourselves. But he adds, self-knowledge is achieved via the other. And in his treatise of the passions, Galen says, it is up to others and not to ourselves to diagnose who we are. And he describes what the therapist or the psychoanalyst is or should be nowadays. It should be someone, he says, that's Galen, not Freud, wait a minute. It should be someone towards whom we feel neither hatred nor affection. Further on, he emphasizes the necessary scrupulous and minute attention of the therapist chosen because he has to make his patient notice the small details that escape his awareness. This last recommendation could just easily have been made by Dr. Sigmund Freud. Duality is used to mask otherness. Jackie Pigeot tells us Plutarch had a remarkable intuition about this in his treatise on moral virtue. Rational soul is to the irrational soul what the soul in general is to the body. So there again, you see, if you go on to the soul, you have to divide it in two to make it function. The, the natural soul and the irrational or the irrational. This is an analogy. Irrational soul is the body of the soul. In his Tusculan Disputations, Cicero emphasizes two facts. The triumph of body-soul dualism and the idea that emotion, passion, vice, and madness do not differ in nature, but only in degree. And that's something I'm very keen on. In his treatise of mental alienation, Philippe Pinel, a prominent psychiatrist, echoing Cicero, states that the origin of madness is passion, and the passions are diseases. Therefore, passions are medical issues. And therefore, it is up to the doctor to become a philosopher. Cicero, along with Pinel, becomes not only a medical authority, but a therapist. Since Cicero, dualism is widely accepted and, of course, would be reaffirmed by Descartes. However, Cicero, in his Tusculan Disputations, seems to change his mind when he says, the diseases of the body need the help of another, the physician 
But as far as the diseases of the soul are concerned, everybody has to be his own doctor. You see, there's always this contradiction whether we should take of ourselves or have somebody else to help us. In the whole subsequent history of what we call psychosomatic medicine, otherness will be locked in a closed circuit between my body and my soul. But both are mine. The responsibility for diseases of the body will be attributed by Pasteur to bacteria and viruses. So that's good. The responsibility for diseases of the mind will prolong debates that go all the way back to Plato and to which we will return in a while, and we're still in them. As for the reciprocal causality and mutual influence of body and soul, it will become the source of an endless and confusing debate. In the 20th century, the literature would be dominated by the problem of stress, which is a psychic phenomenon, the physical and somatic consequences of which would be described abundantly. In the middle of the 20th century, the discovery of tranquilizers, and particularly benzodiazepines, would appear as a miracle cure for stress. However, gradually, and for the past 30 years, and this has been a great problem for all doctors, patients have started fearing the treatment more than the disease because of what they read on internet because of the alleged side effects of medications. This is why stress, anxiety, and old neurosis were gradually treated not by medicine, but by psychotherapy, EMDR, relaxation, hypnosis, and finally the last discovery is meditation, all the way brought from India. All techniques do not entail side effects. A prominent psychosomatician, H.P. Klotz, suggested that psychosomatic should be written in a circle, thus showing that the location of causality in the circle is impossible to determine. <coughs> causality was indeed going around in circles, but so were we. Indeed, the problem of otherness and responsibility was swept aside by this closed dualistic dialectic. It is time now. What, this is what I want to do with you, to get back to the origins and to rediscover the ones who posed the right questions, even if they gave the wrong answers. The first fundamental text, in my view, is Plato's Timaeus. He says, this marrow that is endowed with the soul and that breathes, produces within the organ that allows it to breathe, the vital desire to be expelled and to thus realize the desire for procreation. That is why in men, the shameful parts are insolent and authoritarian in the manner of a living being that refuses to listen to reason. And that's why they strive to dominate under the effect of desire acting to spur them on. This poses two problems whose evolution we will now try to follow. The problem of desire and its origin and the problem of otherness. The male sex organ is, as I said, as Plato said, a living being that refuses to listen to reason and which demands satisfaction driving the human being and determining his behavior. In men, indeed, the independence of the sex organ with respect to the will is quite obvious. But Plato continues. In women, what is called the womb or the uterus is a living being possessed by the desire of making children. If that organ stays sterile, then it gets impatient. It cannot bear this state. And because it starts wandering about the body, it obstructs the orifices through which the air breathed, is in, is breathed in is allowed, and thus blocks respiration and throws the body into the worst extremes and provokes all sorts of other diseases. In men as in women, therefore, the diseases are due to the frustration and aggravation of an intra-physical other. An intra-physical other. An animal endowed with a life of its own, a physical other that is within me. Otherness is embodied, but endowed with its own desires whose unfulfillment is pathogenetic. Men and women are enacted by another which is inside their body and the desires of which they have to satisfy and the penalty of punishment. Arete of Cappadocia confirms in the middle of the woman's pelvic region 
The womb is found, the sexual organ endowed with a life of its own. Nothing is more mobile and restless than the womb. It likes agreeable smells and it is attracted to them while it detests and flees disagreeable odors, such, such that in women, the womb is entirely like an animal within an animal. The same independence is attributed to the male sex, which according to the same author, can go as far as satyriasis or priapism. That condition is an insatiable desire for coitus, which even the accomplishment of the passion does not relieve. Thus the male organ is an animal within an animal again, even more independent, domineering than the one in women. Arity of Cappadocia stresses that the temperament of women, which is naturally less ardent and cooler, I'm not sure he's right there, does not take them to such extremes. Besides, they do not have any organ which could lead to priapism, obviously, just as men do not have any organ which could cause suffocation. You see, those, those uh, people, uh, the Greeks, they figured out that the, 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 the uterus, the, the, the tubes, and the ovaries were sort of an independent animal that would move up or down, bringing, ba bringing about all sorts of diseases and suffocations, because we, when that animal would come up to the breathing areas, it would block respiration and would provoke what we would call today a hysterical fit. But what is interesting is that up to the days of Ambroise Paré, which is the 16th century, uh, the medicine prescribed was to give horrible smells to the nose, to disgust that organ and send it back down. And eventually, they could be more sophisticated even and put between the legs of the woman very nice perfumes so that that same organ would be attracted downstairs. Thus, for Plato, Arity of Cappadocia and for a whole line of thinkers that goes all the way to Ambroise Paré, as I was saying, the sexual organ is, in the, is an independent animal that imposes its desire on its bearer and which makes him or her sick of those desires if they are not satisfied. The otherness of desire is therefore affirmed. It is due to the presence of an intra-physical other. Therefore, according to this tradition, men and women are not responsible for the desires that are imposed upon them. So this has dealt, in a way, with otherness and with responsibility. Now with Christianity, we go to another step, and especially the teachings of St. Augustine. Those theories would be rejected, because God, in his view, could only create a perfect being and he thought it was unthinkable that he could take, could place within this, his creation a pathogenetic other. The observed psychological disorders are therefore to be attributed to an extra psychic other. Not anymore an intra-physical other, but this time an extra psychic other. The devil who is going to possess, obsess, and tempt human beings and impose his desires upon them, making them sick, mad, or unhappy. The treatment of the suffocations of the womb and of priapism would, from then on, be delegated not to doctors and perfumers, but to ecclesiastical judges, exorcists, and inquisitors. Incubuses, succubuses, and witches of all kinds were punished and burned to be purified from the works of the devil. In the Puppet of Desire, I told the story of a famous case of demonic possession that happened in Loudun, France in the 17th century. Mother Jeanne des Anges, who was the head of that convent, declared she was possessed and displayed nervous crises that would today be diagnosed as hysterical fits. She accused Father Urbain Grandier of being the instrument of the devil and of possessing her. Of course, the Girardians that you are, do realize that she had never met or seen Father Grandier and had only heard about him in the parlor by other ladies. He was considered, that was considered by everyone as a further proof that it was indeed the devil that was the agent responsible for all her distress. 
the inquisitors and exorcists step in to deal with the situation. Demonology is a rich field, and the devils are named and hierarchically, hierarchically classified. The result of all this is that the unfortunate Father Urbain Grandier is burnt at the stake. Thus, Mother Jeanne is innocent of a desire that has not that has been imposed upon her by the devil, an extra psychic other. She therefore is not responsible for this desire and the pathological disorders it had entailed. However, Mother Jeanne cannot bear being deprived of the ownership of her desire. In her memoirs, she would try to reconcile the possibility of being the owner of one's desire without being responsible for it. This is the eternal problem. And she concludes her memoirs with this sentence which will open a new path and a new vision in psychology. I was acted upon, she says, but I was acted upon by myself. Mother Jeanne's claim echoes that of all humans of all times. She wants at the same time to be the owner of her desire but not be responsible for its consequences. That claims that explains the ferocious resistance to the hypotheses of René Girard. Mimetic desire indeed deprives the subject of the ownership and the priority of his desire. But Mother Jeanne would be heard eventually by a great genius, great psychiatrist of the 19th century, Professor Sigmund Freud, who would affirm that my desire is mine, generated by myself, but I am not responsible for it because it stems from the unconscious. It is unconscious, so I don't know about it. Thus Freud conquers the culture to which he gives a gift which is the ownership of one's desire, while at the same time exonerating it from any responsibility. Freud's genius invents, this time, an intra-psychic other, the unconscious, that is going to direct us without our knowledge. The ingenious solution was to seduce the culture and impose itself upon psychology, psychiatry, and all other human sciences. This is the reason why René Girard's theory of mimetic desire encounters so much resistance. Indeed, that theory shows that my desire, quote unquote, is not original, does not stem out of my, the interior of my own self, but it is suggested by the other and mimetically copied on the other's desire. It is a borrowed desire, and for that reason, ownership and priority are all the more adamantly asserted. Thus, with René Girard, the otherness of desire is concrete, real, and so is the model. So is the model. Very quickly, I adopted this way of seeing things, which appeared to me to coincide with reality. With René Girard in book three of Things Hidden Since the Foundation of the World, we started to develop what we called an interdividual psychology, expressing by this that we eliminated the, the individual. We had an interdividual, relational psychology, doing away with the notion of individual, monad, and subject. Since then, I have myself pursued research in this direction. In 1981, in my doctoral thesis, I proposed a new meta-psychology, that of the self of desire, mimetic desire, in my view, producing the emergence of a self which is immediately adopted. The self is a variable and fluctuating entity, and precisely for this reason, I asserted that it forgot its origin, or on the contrary, frantically claimed ownership of its desire, while desire, on the other hand, claimed its priority with respect to the other's desire of which it was, in fact, the copy. And that's how I came in the mimetic brain to show that what culture was on the verge of accepting, as the psychoanalytic theory was gradually being abandoned, what the culture was on the verge of accepting, in other words, the mimetic desire and the reality of the model, despite its reluctance, had taken refuge in neurosis and psychosis. The hysterical neurosis through conversion reactions represents the other by otherizing a region, an organ, or a function, or a limb, and making it autonomous 
or as Arete of Cappadocia would say, endowed with a life of its own. So we're going back to the, to the beginning. That organ or function represents the rival in as much as it is responsible for the disease and infirmity. Thus does neurosis manage to represent otherness and avoid responsibility. Psychosis, in turn, represents pathogenic otherness by otherizing a part of the psyche, most often in the form of auditory or synesthetic hallucinations. There again, otherness is responsible for everything. It is represented but dissimulated to allow once more the claim of ownership and priority of my desire and to negate mimetic desire and avoid responsibility. At this point, we would conclude by saying that mimetic desire is the epitome of unconsciousness. René Girard doesn't like that word. He prefers to talk about misrecognition. And I agree with him, because we don't want to be caught up again in the psychoanalytic jargon, rather than the unconscious to emphasize the, act, the active side of the process. I myself, myself have stressed the fact that recognition is the path to healing and wisdom. That recognition cannot be achieved without the help of another or others and requires a process that is not merely cognitive or emotional, but initiatory in the sense of a self-transformation which has been illustrated by the life and teaching of all great sages. Thank you very much for your patience and attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Golian, for such an interesting and enlightened uh, contribution. I am sure that there will be a lot of, a lot of uh, questions after. Uh, well, I shall now proceed to introduce, without ado, our next speaker, Dr. Beatriz Calvo Merino, that is a cognitive neuroscientist trained at University College London and Universidad Complutense of Madrid. Her initial PhD work with Professor Patrick Hagar investigated neurocognitive mechanism involved in action observation, expertise, and dance using neuroimaging methods. She worked at the Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience on a series of studies investigating visual and motor mechanism of body perception. Lately, she developed a line of research investigating the sensory motor neural and cognitive underpinnings of aesthetic perception of performing arts, dance in particular. Her work has been published and disseminated in important journals as well as artistic meetings and public engagement activities. Dr. Merino, the also is yours. Please proceed whenever you are ready. You have 30, 40 minutes. Thank Thanks. you, Elena. Thank you very much for, for this wonderful talk. Shall I, shall I maybe use the... Um, ah, the way No? Uh, can you hear? That, does, does it work? No. Still not. It's open. So you can hear now? Yes? Hello. OK, uh, thank you. Um, I feel like I stand up comedy with this microphone. Um, thank you very much uh, for the organ. Oh, thank you. Um, I wanted to start by thanking uh, the organizers for inviting me to this uh, totally interdisciplinary uh, meeting. It is a very special occasion for me because I come from a very narrow discipline, uh, cognitive neuroscience. And it's always very interesting when we have the opportunity to listen to uh, other fields and to uh, bring our ideas to, to people with all their expertise. So um, I want to talk a little bit about this idea of watching other people from a neuroscientific perspective. Uh, let me see if I put this here. But I guess the first question that I should start with is why do we actually have a brain? So we neuroscientists study the brain. And the question is not only why we have it, 
but why it has developed in the way it has developed to today. And there is a very interesting idea that Daniel Wolpert uh, suggests in a fascinating talk that you can see in TED, uh, a TED talk. And he suggests that we don't have a brain to do things like thinking or seeing the world. He suggests that the real reason why we have the brain as it is today, it's to produce complex movements. And he said that basically we need complex movements or movements to interact with the environment. And there are very, very few occasions where we can interact with the, with the environment and we do not require <coughs> movements. I don't know if you can think of any. Uh, uh, so there are very, very few moments of ways of interacting with others or the environment that doesn't require a movement. Even a blink is a movement, even when you have goosebumps there is a movement of some small cells. So there is movements everywhere. So I'm going to focus on this idea of producing complex movement as a requirement to interact with the environment and with others. The basic way of, uh, you know, of acquiring movements is because obviously we needed to survive in the early times. Later on, we have developed ways of expressing emotions through movements and also very subtle ways of expressing emo uh, affection, uh, also through movement. Always that we have a movement is very important, but if you think about it, there is always someone watching. Many of the times, movements come with someone who is observing the action. And what happens is that we need action observation to learn from other people's experience and acquire learning and experience that other people have already. So this is a very, uh, my way of introducing why movements, why me, why many people as cognitive neuroscientists, we focus a lot on movement. So the question came of how does the brain does this? How we pass from looking at the movements to getting the point, understanding it. Uh, and here is where um, in the 90s, uh, there were some discovery in neuroscience that uh, Jean-Michel didn't talk about it today, but in his book, what I recommend you to read. <laughs> uh, uh, it makes a very good point and a very good link of how this basic neuroscience movement can be linked to many more things, more than to what I'm going to talk about today. But basically, Giacomo Rizzolatti and his colleagues in a laboratory in Palma, uh, in Parma, in Italy, they were investigating the motor neurons in this area of the monkey brain, while the monkey were doing uh, a motor act. And what they found is that the action execution system, so the motor system that we use to do movement ourselves, it's also activated or engaged when we are observing other people's movements. What is a very, uh, uh, not a very new idea in philosophy, that action and, and execution, they are not independent systems, they are systems that come together, but there was no biological evidence to prove that that was happening. And I think this was one of the first, or the first evidence showing this. So basically, this is how it goes. The monkey was doing a very simple action, like getting a little peanut from a tray, and this is the trace of a few neurons in the motor cortex uh, responding while he was doing the action. And when they, what they observed, and uh, like most of the more important discoveries in science, it happened by chance, they observed that when the monkey was not moving, the same neurons were also responding in a very similar way when the experimenter was doing the same action. So you have a same neuron in the brain that is coding motor information and visual information. So this translation that we have been wondering how it's happening, how we translate motor information that we see from others to knowledge that we have in our brain or in our system, this translation doesn't need to happen anymore because they are code in the same system. It's basically like if they use the same currency. So there is no translation needed. We have the same system that can do both things. And uh, they call these neurons or this mechanism mirror neurons because they reflect like a mirror the action that I'm watching in the one that I have in my own motor repertoire. 
And this was in 92, and there are, since then, I will say, 1,000, 2,000 studies investigating different properties of the mirror neurons. I'm going to show you one very early work from uh, Alessandra Humilta and Vittorio Valese, because I, I think it's very interesting. Uh, they basically had these neurons, and they obviously show that they, they respond, they are activated, they are interest, interested in watching other people uh, doing a movement, like a grasping action. But what, what was fascinating is that they, they decide to occlude, to put a screen at the end of the action, so the monkey could not see the end of the action. And what they discovered is that even if the monkey could not see the end of the action, still the response was the same as when they are watching it. So these neurons, they not only respond when you observe an action, but even if you don't see the end, you know what is going to happen, and you finalize the action in your head. What is a very uh, uh, interesting thing, not only they have a visual response, but they are able to take that response to the information you already have in your memory and complete the action. And they have other control studies. I'm not really going to go into that. But importantly, when the action, uh, when, when there is no final goal to the action, when it's not a transitive action, this activation doesn't happen. And they have many other controls. So this was one of the first studies that suggested that mirror neurons they do <coughs> might have something to do with understanding not only the movement, but the intention behind the movement, behind the action. And I think that this study only shows that you can complete the motor plan even if you don't see it. So this is what the data shows. But what it means, it's what is actually really important, is that there is some kind of embodiment of the action, an internal mimicry, uh, that can happen even if you don't see the action completed. There were many studies working with monkeys, but obviously at some point, people wanted to know if the human brain also has a system that responds in a very similar way. And this is a picture, a cartoon picture of a monkey brain, and this is a human cartoon brain. And you can see points there are points in the brain where studies have shown activity um, related to doing actions and to seeing actions. And these studies are normally done with fMRI, so uh, we put people in the scanner and we see which brain areas are active when you do a simple action and when you see those actions. Uh, one particular study I find interesting is that this mimicking of other people's actions it's not happening as a general, as a general idea. It's very concrete. Uh, for example, the motor system of the human body, of the human uh, and the monkey as well, uh, and, and all the animals, it's organized in a somatotopic way. That means that in an area called uh, primary motor cortex, there are different bits in the brain that they control different parts of your body. So we have an area that controls your face, your hand, and your feet. And what the studies on action observation have shown is that when you observe, and this picture is during observation, when you observe mouth actions, you have more activation in these ventral areas, close to the areas that you have, that you use to produce the movements yourself. When you see hand actions, you have activation in these areas, that they are the areas that you use to do hand actions yourself. So you don't just imitate or mimic other people in general, but at a very, very specific level. So there is a very defined level of mimicry in, in, during observation. And around this time was when I went to London as part of my PhD. And, and we had this question, and this is the work I have been developing during my PhD and, and, and a little bit later on. And is that most of the studies that were done at that time were just very basic. We are a bit more than just hand actions and mouth actions. We are able to produce complex actions. And more importantly, everybody develop their own experience with their actions. Not all of us have the same experience. 
So here, a, a little example to see how we all can develop different experience. So we all have, uh, let's say, a motor system, a tabula rasa, some things that we all can do. For example, we all can walk, we all can run, we all can play football. But like in any domain of knowledge, you can excel in, in some knowledge and acquire a bit more knowledge than others that allow you to get some acquired skills that you might have and other people might not have. Okay, might not have. So you become an expert in a domain, let's say in a motor domain, but here we have another person that is an expert in a motor domain, but it's totally different from this domain. If you put this person to do what these people do, he probably is not that good and the same the other way around. When I was preparing the talk, um, Nadal was still inside Wimbledon, <laughs> and I was hoping to uh, uh, make some comments about that, but unfortunately, it's gone now. Um, basically, the point I want to make with this is that, and this is an example in the motor domain, because it's where I work, is that we all develop our own personal experience, but at the same time, some of our personal experience can be shared with other people that has the same experience and not with others. So we wanted to use this kind of dissociation in the motor system to understand if when we observe other people, do we actually mimic them? Because can we mimic if we don't have the experience that the other people has? According to this motor system, it feels a bit, a bit difficult. So here we have another example. We have an observer here. So, uh, uh, from the rear window, a uh, movie. So if you remember the movie, he's observing through the window and he's watching actions. He's watching a lady doing actions. Many of the times he's watching uh, a lady doing dance movements. Obviously, this observer, if we ask a question, he can mimic. He doesn't have the motor ability to mimic in his head the dance movement that he's observing. A, because I haven't asked him, but probably he doesn't have the ballet training. And B, because he's in a wheelchair, because he has a leg uh, broken. So there is no potential mimicking in that, in that idea, in, that, in, that, in the same concept. But if we have uh, a bailarina, she will be able to mimic, to represent in her head the same movements that she is watching. So this is basically what we wanted to test with fMRI. So we wanted to see if when people is watching actions that they can do, that they know, that they are familiar, they have activation in this mirror system. And if this activation is stronger than when other people that don't have that familiarity, that experience, is watching the same actions. That's the core question of what we wanted to ask. Um, <coughs> and here I had. Uh, I'm going to try to play a couple of videos. I was trying them before, if you bear with me a second. Um, here I had this, yeah. So uh, here we have a, a ballet movement, just a three seconds ballet movement. If any of you have done ballet in your life or you are experienced, you probably will be resonating in your head. Uh, if not, we don't know what's happening. <laughs> And here is an example of a capoeira movement. And why we chose ballet and capoeira? Basically, if you can see, for the non-expert, that, that include me, uh, this is basically, when I'm observing this, I'm observing somebody with black costume doing some leg arm jump. And I don't see much difference between this and this. But for an expert dancer or, or an expert Capoeirista, they will be seeing different things. So we put uh, a group of ballet dancers, uh, and they were from the Royal Ballet in London. There could not be more royal dancers. And a group of, uh, of capoeira dancers from different schools in, in, in London uh, in the scanner uh, to see what was happening in the brains when they were looking at different movements, not, not only this, like a series of movements of this. And we also had like uh, psychology students that they are normally all control students, people with no experience. And what happened, and this is just a, a <coughs> the cartoon of a picture of a brain with many blobs, but the ones with the arrow are the 
brain areas that they have been described like areas that participate in doing a movement yourself. And what we found here is that these areas are strongly more activated when you see the movement that you can do, so the ones in red. When the ballet dancers look at ballet movements and the capoeira dancers look at capoeira. And this is, this is, the, this is a graph of the intensity of the activity in these brain areas that they are well known for being mirror neuron areas. So the ones in red are where the ballet people look at ballet movements <coughs> and when the capoeira people look at capoeira movements. And uh, so you can see those are stronger than when they are watching something else. What happened with the psychology students, the control participants, the no experience for them, the, the brain doesn't see any difference between seeing a ballet movement or a capoeira movement. <coughs> those mirror neuron areas, they are still active. We never have a brain at zero. So they, they, they are working on, but they are unable to distinguish any difference between them. And this activation is much smaller than when you are an expert and have some level of expertise on that. So that was, that was the core of the idea. Um, and this is basically the summary of what I said have a stronger internal resonance when we see actions that we know. And then moving to something maybe a bit more useful. So we have internal resonance and we prove that with fMRI. And I've shown you one study. There are again another thousand of fMRI studies uh, completing this story on the same lines. But what are the functions of, of this pyro system? Or in other words, if there is an internal resonance that is happening, a internal simulation, a internal mimicry, what is the reason for that? Um, some studies suggest it might be because of imitation, we need to see from others to learn from them and uh, imitate uh, the motor response. It helps social learning. Uh, we need that for action understanding, from recognizing emotions, or maybe just allow you to see better to see better actions of others. There are many studies on these domains. I'm going to focus in a couple of them, just very briefly. And I'm not going to go so much into the details of the scientific details of the, of the methods, just to give you a few flavors of how we can uh, provide data to this. For example, here, we thought we can ask the following question. So, does expertise help us to understand the story behind the action better than when you don't have the expertise? Or does uh, expertise allow you to understand the emotion behind the action that is being expressed? Um, something important is that to understand actions and to understand emotions, this is an example with um, uh, static uh, paintings and a sculpture. Uh, so we see a body also that is representing emotion. It's not an action, it's not a dynamic movement, but it's a body that we can also see and we can also understand the story behind and the emotion behind. Uh, not only we can understand it, but probably we can even feel it uh, on ourselves. So we wanted to, to do the same with uh, actions. When the emotion and the story is told with the body. And the tomorrow uh, is where there is the travel to the theater. The, uh, the performing art is a, is a wonderful, it's a, it's a wonderful stage to, uh, to study the body uh, and the link with emotions. And the question we wanted to see is like, is people who is expert and people who is not expert, is there any difference in them when they are watching this? a type of performing a body movements, expressing emotions. I don't know if you are able to recognize. So basically what we did is we took real pieces of dance and we cut small pieces at moments where uh, there were significant moments, where the bailarina was maybe expressing the sadness for losing the love or the happiness for, for uh, recovering uh, Love again is all very love-based. <laughs> these stories, um, and and then we put them 
uh, this time not in the scanner, but we wanted to see if they can recognize the motion there and also if they can feel it. And then we came across this other technique and I move a little bit away from the brain to see to something more related to emotion. And we use this technique called galvanic skin response that basically uh, is just a couple of electrodes that you attach to the tips of your finger and uh, measure the electrodermical response of your skin, a little bit like how much you are sweating. So it's a level of arousal that pick up very sensitive levels and is sensitive to emotions. So uh, we wanted to see if understanding that emotion can be picked up with this kind of signal that is a bit more physiological signal of your own body. And this is, uh, this is the data and there are many more, thing, many more things here I haven't really told you about, control studies, but if we uh, focus on here, that is where um, we have the galvanic response. Basically, uh, the only significant effect that we find is that the dancers and not the controls show a difference in the galvanic response in this electrophysiological, uh, very sensitive uh, measure while they were watching and understanding the movements as happy or sad. So all the movements we gave them were either happy or sad, and they have to decide which one they think it was. So the dancers were the only ones that saw a physiological difference when perceiving positive emotions and negative emotions. And the controls didn't have any difference, so they, they were not sensitive at that basic emotional level, to the emotion expressed in the dance. So this is basically the message that I wanted to, to send. Um, so completing with the story before, so this experience, this internal <coughs> resonance, doesn't allow us to, to find a stronger neural simulation at the, at the brain level, at the neural level, but also at a physiological level, that is maybe a level that is much more rooted into basic emotional uh, responses. And finally, just wanted to give you another glimpse of another type of study that we try to do to see if this internal resonance, resonance allow you to have a better perception, very basic visual perce perception. So does it allow you to see better? And just to give you another example of daily life, so if you have a look at this video here, and then I'm going to ask you a few questions. So it's a video that visually doesn't have much quality, but that's probably not the problem with the video. Um, so if you have a quick look. Raúl Herrera dice, está preparado José María Gutiérrez Guti para pegar la pelota. Raúl, el hombre más destacado. So I don't know how many of you uh, watch football usually. Um, I don't know if any of you notice what happened. Did someone score a goal? Yeah? 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 Uh, did you notice what leg was used? No. Was any kind of a special yeah. kick or something? Or? Yeah. Huh? yeah. Uh, so we have people that didn't see much, and people who actually noticed that was a chilena, like a flying kick. Um, so there are different levels of appreciation that with a very, with a very similar um, kind of blur uh, visual information, you get different information depending on how much experience you have. And obviously you can have different levels of experience. You can have experience of being the coach, of being just the coach potato, or just having a lot of visual experience with it. So daily example, and we bring this in the laboratory, in a bit more of a, a boring way, but with the same idea behind it. And we had these bailarinas doing movements before. And we thought of using a technique called point light display that has become very popular to study actions. Because basically, when you have an action, and you see myself moving around, you see my movements, but you also see my arms, my face, the, a lot of information related to the body that is converging together with the movement information. So this time, um, sometimes we want to investigate what happened, what information is transmitted only through the movement, not because of my face or the size of my body, just the movement, the kinematic. And there is this technique called point light. So if you attach 
dots of light to the joints of a person, and you do a video in a dark room, you get something like that. When I did these videos, it was a long time ago. I literally attached put dots of light to the, to the joints of a dancer and make the video in a dark room. These days, there's something called motion capture, and these kind of things where you don't need to switch off the lights, and the computer gives you all this information. But basically, what we did is that we did many videos from the bailarinas in the Royal Ballet doing the same movement. And if you are a very good bailarina, you do the movement once and 10 times, and they all do the movement in a very similar way, because that's their job. But there are obviously a small difference between them. So we did many videos of this. We put them to participants in a computer to see if they were able to say, is this the same ballerina or a different ballerina? Same ballerina or different ballerina? And these are the results. So we have bailarinas, so we had female bailarinas and male uh, uh, dancers as well. And this is, this is how well they did. So bailarinas, uh, male and female, they do very well. Uh, do, they are able to find this small difference that they are very small, very visual. So the experience allows them to see more. When you put the picture upside down, this is a control we use, inverted. They are not very good at all. So once you disrupt the image, and it's not as you have learned it, then that, that process doesn't work anymore. <coughs> and then we also ask against psychology students, and they basically were not very good at that. It was a chance. And they didn't mind very much if the picture was upside down or inverted <laughs> or in many different conditions. They did equally bad. So this is just another example of how this a very specific uh, experience shared that you have with the person you are watching uh, allow you not to have changes at the neural level, at the physiological level, but also at the behavioral level, at a very simple behavioral level. So all this together has to obviously do something in the real world. And with this, I just finish. And obviously, most of the studies are very laboratory-based, and they are they control one or two or two things. They, they are not really examples of the real world. But if you want to see the bigger picture, we tend to group and share experience with everybody. And uh, for a reason, we try to build groups that they are like me. And when I say like me, sometimes like <coughs> me doesn't need to be only in the motor way, as I have been explaining here, but also in the visual, uh, perceptual, or ideological way. So we try to share with others that they are like me at many different domains. And just to finish with a very, uh, I, I guess, recent still paper uh, from Andrew Meltoff, who did very interesting work in the 70s with uh, babies and imitation, where he was suggesting, and I'm just going to read from here, that this recognition of self-other equivalence in action give rise to interpreting others as having similar psychological states such as perceptions and emotions. So the like-me nature uh, of others is the starting point for social cognition, and uh, not its culmination. So I just leave it here um, to say that, obviously, I provide you only data when you are like me in a motor way, because that's the work I do, but I think it can be generalized to many other domains. Uh, just a reminder of the different levels that we could touch. I'm sure you can expand them. And with a big thank you again to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to share this with such an interdisciplinary audience and to many of the lab members that allow that this work is possible. Thanks. Thank you very much, Beatriz, for your nice talk and your work, uh, for showing us uh, the neurobiological, neurocognitive groundings of mimetic theory, emotion, desire. This is very interesting to me. It's an interdisciplinary work that uh, I think that uh, I will afterwards uh, some put uh, some questions. Well, uh, now, thank you. and. Um, we have, I have the pleasure to revert to the floor and open up the subject of both talks for questions and discussions. Please raise your hands and claim your turn. Uh, there are many hands. I think 
I don't know who was the first. We begin here. Thanks. You heard me? Okay, yes. Good. It's a question about communication and gestures, as I'm doing right now. And uh, really for both of you, um, what is the relation between ourselves and our own gestures? Are our gestures behind us? Uh, going on at the same time, are they ahead of us? Are they for us sometimes too, with prods and so on? And then what is the relation to the people we're gesturing to in terms of, I mean, are, 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 yeah, are the gestures communicative or, or exhortative or something? I mean, you must have, both have lots of thoughts about that and I'd love to hear them, thank you. Thanks. <laughs> 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 oh, I, like, I like what you say when the gestures are, um, <coughs> I have this impression that, that all movements, whether they are gestures or other things, they are always ahead of us. And, and there are some very interesting studies on agency uh, that, um, that uh, they basically propose people to, to press a key whenever they want, like with a finger, to produce a movement. And they measure when the movement is produced. And they also measure uh, with electroencephalography when the brain, uh, the, send the signal to produce a movement. And basically what happened is that the brain uh, is aware of you producing the movement before you even decide to put uh, the finger on that key. So I think gestures are ahead of us, uh, just for a 20 milliseconds maybe, but our brain seems to decide to do the movements before they actually happening. Uh, so it's for both of us, it's for both of us. <laughs> but that, that's, for, that's for us doing, and then for the, um, Regarding the other person, there is, uh, I don't really know, it's not, not, not my fear, but um, there is this idea of when you see other people moving, what do you imitate? The gestures that they are doing or the complementary gestures that you are required to do that you have learned? So if someone gives you a hand, the, the action that you have to do is not imitating my movement, otherwise that will not work, it's the, to do the complementary action for that. So I think both brains are ahead in producing the movements and the other reading very early on signs of the movement to give, to, to, to give way to this complementary action. Mockery. Sorry, you don't also have to restrain yourself from mockery, right? I mean, if I make the gestures you make, boom, that's it. No more communication. Well, uh, yeah. I, I, I think our brain has developed the ability to do all these things without you having to pay attention to it. Otherwise, it will be very difficult if we will have to be uh, inhibiting all the time behavior to mimic others. And this is actually, and here maybe I pass, I pass the ball when people have uh, different psychiatric or neurological disorders that they are unable to inhibit that behavior and they mimic and they use objects all the time because they cannot stop. Yes, uh, thank you for your, uh, for your uh, speak. My question is the follow. You said that the movement in the brain, the, in the brain preceded the action of the movement. But what is the action in the brain? Is this a, perce a perception of a f of a, of a, a, a fixity of a, a, a view, internal view of the movement? Uh, what kind of is it only a physical action? Is it more than a physical action? What is it really? That's my question. A virtual. Perception. I think, uh, I think it's all those things uh, together and probably distributed along many different areas that they are connected. But it's a combination of, of how it feels to that action, how it feels for others to see it, We have many representation of actions at different levels, uh, probably distributed. This is that all of them. Otherwise, there will not be other way. Uh, uh, I have a question about uh, Girard and uh, extending it to psychiatry. Um, you extend his ideas about desire uh, to psychiatry, which seems to me quite obvious. 
it, uh, the question is, could we also extend his other ideas about culture to psychiatry? For instance, uh, his idea about culture is, what is the function of culture? It has to do with protection, with containment, with protection against chaos. Could also this, these ideas be extended into the world of psychiatry? Well, thank you for this question. It's very interesting. It's uh, uh, what what actually is every day's experience is that you cannot uh, exercise psychiatry. You cannot practice psychiatry without taking into account the cultural background of the patient you have you're facing, and that goes very far. I remember the first, the, the very first times I went to the United States, and I had the opportunity to to visit, you know, hospitals and wards and things. And everybody said, "Well, you know, you you should have no problem because you talk to those veterans and so on, and you know, you're able to talk to them in English and understand what they say." And I said, "Yes, I do understand what they say, but not necessarily what they mean." <laughs> And because you, the meaning is what refers to culture. And this is why, you know, when, when you're with a French patient, a European patient, uh, an Oriental patient, a Japanese patient, everything is very different. Even the mimics, you know, the Japanese would come and tell you that his mother just died by laugh laughing. And you would say that he's schizophrenic <laughs> if he were European. But he's not, he's just polite. It's just polite. So I think I completely agree with you that the cultural background is of extreme importance in asserting what, you know, if, if, if an African tells you that he's being possessed by a genius, he may be extremely normal. Now, if, 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 if your colleague here in the university tells you that he's being possessed by the dean, then he may have a problem. <laughs> 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 I think thank you. I think that there was a question in the back. Uh, there was two questions. Yes. And behind. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for excellent talks. Um Beatrice, uh you had a picture of uh Mourinho and I wondered many times how interesting it would be to see a brain scan of Mourinho. <laughs> because <laughs> I'm a Manchester United <coughs> fan, and I, every Saturday or Sunday I go down to the pub and, and watch them. And you know, Mourinho is very different. Firstly, he's not a manager of, uh, he hasn't played uh, high-level football himself. And, and he has this astonishing success. But his way of behaving is totally anti-mimetical. <laughs> you know, if Manchester United has won, he's just completely sour, you know? And angry, more or less. And I wondered about this, that his anti-mimetic uh, way of behaving is one of the clues to his success. Of course, he is very mimetic, but he, 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 doesn't, he, he, he doesn't show it. And I just wonder, can that be? Because many people maybe fail because they are too mimetic. And isn't there a kind of a hidden secret in Mourinho's very anti-mimetic way of behaving? Thank you. <laughs> what do you think about this? Um, you know, maybe I can give you the opposite example. I also had a picture of Zinedine Zidane, who very successf su successful, and he's on the opposite as, 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 as Mourinho in the, at the personal level, probably a lot of uh, mimetic uh, behavior. Only one time I've seen him like getting away of, of, of his classical uh, behavior. That was yeah. when he, that, that picture I had there. So I wonder when, when being mimetic is is an adaptation, is useful, and when you need to come out of there and express yourself in a different way. Uh, I don't know the relationship with success. I'm an Arsenal fan. <laughs> <laughs> so, conflict of interest. <laughs> 
Yes. Thank you very much. Um, I'd have two uh, a theoretical and a practical question for Dr. Ogulia. Uh, the theoretical question, uh, you argued uh, that the distinction of body and soul was used and was needed in order uh, to, to ground the disowning of responsibility. Now, would you say that this is the only reason this distinction existed, or are there other reasons why people had this distinction? And the second question would be a practical question. Um, what, the, if, if you could give us an example, what actually changes in psychotherapy when you leave Freud behind and, and do it uh, inspired by Girard? What, what, what's, what difference do follow? Thank you. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to take a while to answer that, but I'll try to answer it very quickly. Uh, you know, the distinction between body and soul is just because, you know, it's a question of creating duality somewhere, you know, creating duality. Because you, I, I tried to explain that since the, 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 the dawn of mankind, you cannot produce any psychological movement. Uh, on your own. You have to be at least two. So uh, the body and soul and then the other and then so on and so forth. So you have to be two and this otherness has to be introduced uh, by any way, shape or form if you want to produce movement or explain simply movement. The, the, the second thing you ask is uh, how did uh, Girard change my way of doing? It's not when you say, uh, when you forget about Freud. I don't forget about Freud. I mean, I think Freud was a uh, in his time, he was, uh, I mean, a, a, a very, very intelligent man, and, and the proof is that he found a solution that suited the culture for many, many years. Still now, many people uh, agree with that. Um, how can I explain? You see, if I think that the, the best way is is to tell you about two little sketches, stories, okay? First one is uh, one of my very, very first patients had gone through about 30 years of psychoanalysis. She was an, old, uh, an elderly woman and her psychoanalyst had died and I was a very young uh, <laughs> psychiatrist at the time, so I took over and she said, now you have to be a very good psychoanalyst, so shut up. I said, fine. <laughs> and. Uh, so she lied down, and uh, I shut up. <laughs> and uh, she told me that she had uh, deprived her only son in her will from all her belongings and had given them to. So I couldn't prevent myself, although I had to shut up. But I said one word. I said, why? <laughs> <laughs> And she turned to me and she said, I don't know. It happened between my ego and my superego. I, I wasn't even aware. <laughs> I don't know. That's one way. <laughs> the other way, the other thing I can tell you about is that story about that young girl more recently, a uh, young woman. Uh, she was having problems in her family. And then her brother came with his new wife, and she was <coughs> staying with her parents. But then the brother came and the wife, and they stayed with them as well. And she started becoming more and more agitated and anxious and furious and so on and so forth, to the point that she started hallucinating. So they called me in, I put her in a clinic, and I asked her, what, what kind of hallucinations do you have? And she said, well, I hear a voice telling me to kill my mother. I said, to kill your mother, but you love your mother. She said, yeah, yeah, this is why I can't understand. I said, you know what? I, I think actually uh, you've been bothered by the visit of your brother and your sister-in-law, whom you hate, I think. She said, yes, I do. So I said, don't you think that you should tell the voice that in fact she should tell you to kill your sister-in-law, not your mother? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, Yes, and you see, the, the identification of the rival 
is the key issue in every psychotherapy. If you arrive, if you get to identifying the rival, you sort of disinflate the symptom. You see what I mean? I'm just trying to give you those two little examples. I'm sorry, it would take us about 48 hours if we wanted to develop the whole thing. We have only no, let, me get, let me get back to what we're saying. Uh, you know, when we say hello, we, we, not, we do not imitate, we, we reciprocate. Imitation and reciprocation is not. But we, we, we shake hands, we're friends, you see. But suppose one second we're friends, and our first brain says to us, he, 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 he takes in the cloakroom, you know, a nice hat of, uh, you know, intellectual uh, uh, similarity and, uh, and whatever. And, and I think, oh, this is a very intelligent lady. She shakes my hand. You know. She's brilliant, which is true. And uh, <laughs> But suppose now, for one reason or another, that I try to shake her hand, and she says, no, no I would never shake her hand of a stupid, stupid guy like you. Then <laughs> my first brain will say, well, you know, starts imagining, you know, from paranoid ideas. You know, why, why is she against me? The, the, somebody has been working her up against me. And the emotional brain, the emotional brain, the limbic brain, would sort of say, well, uh, she is, uh, she, she's not nice. I, I, I hate her. I hate her. She hates me. I hate her. So you see, it, 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 the reciprocity can be positive, and we are friends, or can be negative, and we are enemies. And this is a click that takes place all the time when we meet somebody. When we meet somebody, we immediately click positive or negative, and, and this entails the whole sequence of events afterwards. I just wanted to make this little. <laughs> Thank you. We have two more questions. OK. In the back and after, maybe one of these. I'm sorry. All right. Uh, thank you both very much. I think my question you and it's really very easy because it relates to that old topic of uh, free will um, <laughs> and to me it always seemed in engaging with me that uh, the awareness that it creates mimetic desire and relationship dynamics gives us the choice to maybe take a step back and not to in engage in certain behaviors and we have talked these past days uh, in, in some conversations about freedom being the ability to do something but also not to do something and now it seems to me from the arguments of, with mirror neurons and what we've seen we can hear now I don't know what is happening no in this moment no okay all right. Yes. So what part did you miss? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> so I, I, all right. I pick it up on no. one word. All right. I so pick up your question on one word all right. that, you so said, that you mentioned, OK? Yeah. The more able we are to mimic uh, as dancers, for instance, the less free we seem to be, at least at the level of perception, not to mimic. And I think I read an article on mirror neurons some years back in Spiegel Online, where uh, also one of the researchers in it argued that it's all yeah, free will. We can sort of just cast out that notion again. So I'm wondering where we're at, really. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you for that question. Uh, no, no. Um, you, the, the key word, I think, in your question is the problem, the immense, the huge problem of freedom. And I've been reflecting upon it, and I actually am writing an essay on this. If indeed everything is mimetic, is there any little place left for freedom? Yeah. And that is a key issue. And I'm terribly sorry that I'm not able to discuss it with René Girard, because that would have been a very interesting and stimulating conversation. But I've tried to find two avenues of thinking about this problem. First Avenue is the only little hole of freedom we have is in the choice of the model. In other words, we have the possibility to choose one mother or the other. Uh, let me take two extremes. Like, for instance, now in France, you're a young uh, Algerian origin 
uh, let's say, Muslim uh, faith, and you can choose either to go to the Islamic State and become a, an extremist, integrist, Islamic, or you can choose to become a very French uh, type of culture guy, you know, because you're a French citizen. So that's the first thing. You can eventually still have the ability to choose your model. And the second little avenue of freedom is once you've chosen your model, to make sure all through your relationship to that model, never to let it s go to the rivalrous, to become a rival or an obstacle. You see what I mean? In other words, that applies, for instance, to marriage. If you have a companion, if you are married, if you are living with somebody, or if you have a friend, or a master, or a master, you've chosen that person, and then every day you must make sure that your relationship doesn't become rivalrous or that the other doesn't become an obstacle to you. That is maybe the two things which I've been thinking about, but I'd be delighted if anyone has any other idea about the problem of freedom. I don't know if you want to. I don't know. <laughs> that's, okay. That's a OK. Very well. Thank you very much. The last one, uh, I, I think that here there was one. Uh, thank you very much for these two outstanding presentations. The uh, one comment, the, in fact, Dr. Gurion told us that when he's uh, in consultation with his patients, he's, uh, the patient is uh, giving his or her story, and then uh, Dr. Gurion said, okay, you told me what you're suffering from. Tell me wh from whom you are suffering from. <laughs> uh, and my question is, we heard a presentation about one about desire, what about movement? Can we consider that desire is movement? I'll go back to what uh, I, I, I was. I, I, I go back to what Professor Calvo Merino was saying. And there is only one word which I would like to change. When she says that you know the monkey, when he sees the gesture, he picks up not only the movement but the intention. Just take the, replace the word intention by the word desire, and you got the whole answer to your question. In other words, we pick up the desire of the other one. We know what he is aiming at. And the more astute we are, the more we know exactly. Like, I'm sure that if you go out in a party or something with, with your spouse or your companion, you pick up immediately, you know, if she or he is looking to somebody else in the audience. <laughs> and the same thing in politics, you know. Uh, when you have a meeting, you immediately see in the audience the ones that are against you or ready to attack you or ready in the country to, to support you. So, I mean, the, 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 we are, our brains are not only connected as mirrors, they are connected in Wi-Fi. They are connected in Bluetooth. <laughs> they are connected in all sorts of ways. And uh, we don't only share movements. We don't only share desires. We share also emotions. Like, you know, if everybody's laughing, you will laugh. And if everybody's crying, you will cry. The emotion is very contagious. And contagion, and now Bill is certainly going to agree with me, contagion is another word for mimesis, right? <laughs> Well, uh, thank you very much. I think we have more questions, but we must continue you in the coffee. Eh? We return here at 11, but thank you for your lavish contributions. <laughs>